Today's video is designed for those of you who enjoy listening to true crime stories while relaxing, sleeping, or multitasking. There's no footage, just the narration, so you can sit back, unwind, and immerse yourself in the story. From Night Out to Nightmare The Amy Blunt Case On a crisp November night in 1990, the peaceful streets of St. Augustine, Florida, became the backdrop for a chilling disappearance that would shake the community to its core. Amy Blunt, a vibrant 21-year-old college student, vanished without a trace after a seemingly ordinary night out with friends. Her disappearance set off a desperate search that would reveal a horrifying tale of betrayal and violence. As the investigation unfolded, the focus turned to Sean Nolan, a mutual acquaintance who was the last person seen with Amy. However, the case took a dark turn with the discovery of her body months later, buried in a secluded area. The trail led to Timothy Gatchell, a man whose initial story and behavior only deepened the mystery. This is the tragic story of Amy Blunt's final hours, the investigation that followed, and the grim resolution that would bring justice to her memory. Amy Blunt, born on October 1, 1969, in the quaint town of Homestead, Florida, was a beacon of warmth and joy. Her laughter was a symphony of happiness that resonated through the hearts of everyone she met. Raised in a nurturing family, Amy thrived in an environment of love and camaraderie. But her world shattered when, at the tender age of 14, her father passed away, leaving a gaping void in her heart. Despite the profound grief that could have easily consumed her, Amy's spirit remained unbroken. She embraced life with an unwavering positivity that inspired those around her. After high school, she ventured to Flagler College in the historic city of St. Augustine, a place as rich in heritage as it was in charm. Founded by Spanish explorers, St. Augustine's ancient streets and unique architecture offered a picturesque backdrop for Amy's academic and social adventures. At 21, Amy was a radiant presence on campus, her circle of friends expanding with every passing year. On November 6, 1990, just weeks shy of her graduation, Amy's excitement was palpable as she prepared for a reunion with her closest friends. Her roommate and best friend, Kelly, joined her and another friend, Kim, for a night out at a beloved local bar. The evening unfolded in a haze of laughter and camaraderie with the trio soaking in the joy of their long-awaited gathering. Sean Nolan, a mutual acquaintance with whom Amy shared a spark of mutual attraction, joined them later in the evening. Although their relationship had yet to materialize into anything formal, the chemistry between them was undeniable. As the night wore on, Kelly complained of feeling unwell and decided to head back to the dorm. Kim soon followed, leaving Sean and Amy alone. Their moments together were filled with an easy, comfortable intimacy. But as the clock ticked towards the early hours of the morning, a sense of unease began to creep in. The next day, Kelly awoke to find Amy's bedroom door ajar and her friend nowhere to be seen. Initially attributing her absence to a late arrival to class, Kelly's worry escalated when Amy failed to show up. The absence was unnerving, and Kelly, along with Kim, decided to confront Sean, who had been with Amy the previous night. Sean's account of the evening was vague and inconsistent. He claimed that after leaving the bar, he and Amy had strolled towards the beach before deciding to call it a night. According to Sean, they had a minor argument while waiting for a taxi, and Amy chose to walk back to the dorm alone. Kelly's frustration mounted as Sean's casual demeanor suggested a troubling indifference to Amy's well-being. Determined to find answers, Kelly and Kim scoured the campus, asking friends and classmates if they had seen Amy. Their search yielded nothing. As hours turned into a full day, Kelly reported Amy's disappearance to the police, who initially treated the case with skepticism due to Amy's age. Despite Kelly's pleas, the authorities showed little urgency, further deepening her fear. As Amy's family was informed, her sister arrived in St. Augustine the following morning to aid in the search. Despite their efforts, including distributing flyers and enlisting media support, the search yielded no substantial leads. The community rallied, but every attempt to locate Amy seemed to end in frustration. The investigation took a dramatic turn when the police finally interviewed Sean again. His story had shifted, 
He now claimed that after parting ways with Amy, she vanished from the street while he waited for the taxi. This new account seemed implausible and raised suspicions about his involvement. The taxi driver's testimony further complicated matters, revealing that Sean had been found sleeping on a bench rather than waiting for a ride. As weeks passed, the case drew comparisons to a series of brutal murders in nearby Gainesville, but investigators soon ruled out any connection. The growing tension in St. Augustine was palpable, and the police, facing mounting public pressure, intensified their search efforts. The reward offered for information led to numerous tips, most of which were false or misleading. Yet one call stood out, a witness reported seeing Amy getting into a car with two men, providing a sliver of hope in the otherwise bleak investigation. The witness's account was detailed, but his credibility was questioned. Despite passing a lie detector test, investigators remained cautious, their instincts telling them that something was amiss. As weeks turned into months, the search for Amy seemed to falter until, on January 1st, two months after her disappearance, a disturbing discovery was made on the outskirts of St. Augustine. A man walking his dog found a skeleton partially buried under a pile of logs and bricks. The grisly find was confirmed to be Amy Blunt when dental records matched. The body, wrapped in a green shirt, showed clear signs of a violent death with multiple stab wounds and abrasions. The discovery shattered her family and friends, who had clung to hope until the very end. The investigation then turned to Timothy Gatchell, a local resident whose trailer was on the property where Amy's body was found. Initially a suspect, Timothy's connection to the crime became clearer. Forensic evidence, including hair and blood traces, pointed to his involvement. Further investigation revealed inconsistencies in his story and pointed to a chilling confession. Timothy admitted to killing Amy in a fit of rage, his memory fragmented by a supposed loss of consciousness. His confession detailed how he had attacked her, disposed of her body, and covered it with debris. The horrifying truth was laid bare, leading to Timothy's conviction for first-degree murder. On July 15, 1991, he was sentenced to life in prison, sparing him from the death penalty in exchange for his confession. Despite the closure, suspicions lingered around Toby, a man who had been with Timothy that night. Though he was not charged, his involvement remained a topic of speculation. Timothy, now 53, remains incarcerated, his actions forever leaving a scar on the lives of those who loved Amy Blunt. After months of uncertainty and a heartbreaking search, the murder of Amy Blunt was brought to light with the arrest and confession of Timothy Gatchell. His admission of guilt revealed a night of horror driven by jealousy and aggression. Timothy's plea for a life sentence, avoiding the death penalty, was a stark reminder of the profound impact his actions had on Amy's family and friends. As he serves his life sentence, the case remains a somber reflection on the fragility of life and the darkness that can lurk behind even the most benign facades. Amy Blunt's story, marked by her kindness and potential, serves as a poignant reminder of the importance of seeking justice and remembering those whose lives were cut tragically short. The Unfolding Mystery of Sherry Holtz, A 25-Year Quest for Justice In the serene city of Sanford, Florida, December 1999 began with a chilling discovery that would cast a long shadow over the community. The body of Sherry Holtz, a 50-year-old woman whose life was marred by domestic struggles, was found brutally murdered in the woods. For nearly 25 years, the investigation into her death would falter and stall, but recent advancements in forensic science would eventually bring long-awaited justice. This is the detailed story of Sherry Holtz's murder and the relentless pursuit that followed. Sherry Holtz was born on November 17, 1949 in Sanford, a city known for its southern hospitality and close-knit community. From a young age, Sherry was known for her vivacious and friendly demeanor. She enjoyed socializing and frequently visited local spots to meet friends and relax. Despite her outwardly cheerful personality, Sherry's personal life was riddled with challenges. In the early 1990s, Sherry entered a relationship with Gary Durrance. Initially, the relationship seemed promising but it soon became evident that it was plagued by domestic issues. Sherry and Gary's relationship deteriorated over time, 
marred by frequent arguments and incidents of domestic violence. Despite Sherry's efforts to improve their relationship, the situation only worsened, painting a troubling picture of her personal life. By December 1999, Sherry and Gary's relationship had reached a critical juncture. On December 2nd, an explosive argument led Gary to expel Sherry from their shared home. This sudden eviction left Sherry vulnerable, both emotionally and physically. With nowhere else to turn, Sherry sought comfort in a local bar she frequented, a familiar place where she could momentarily escape her troubles. December 3, 1999, would turn out to be the last night anyone saw Sherry alive. After leaving the bar alone, she likely intended to find a safe place to spend the night. The cold December night offered little comfort, and as Sherry walked away from the bar, she unknowingly approached danger. The morning of December 4, 1999, brought a horrifying discovery. Sherry's body was found in a secluded wooded area, lying on a concrete slab just 20 feet from a nearby trail. The scene was a shocking tableau of brutality. Sherry had been beaten severely, strangled, and her throat had been slashed. The ferocity of the attack left the Sanford community reeling, and the investigation began in earnest. The detectives who arrived at the scene faced a complex and daunting task. The crime scene offered few clear clues, and the forensic technology of the time was inadequate for providing conclusive evidence. Among the items found at the scene was a bloody lock blade knife. However, forensic capabilities of the late 1990s could not deliver definitive results. Gary Durrance, Sherry's former partner, quickly became a primary suspect due to his volatile relationship with Sherry. Investigators interviewed him multiple times, but without solid evidence linking him to the crime, they could not proceed with charges. Witnesses from the bar confirmed that Sherry had been there on the night of December 3rd, but none could place her near the crime scene, leaving the detectives with a frustratingly cold trail. As the investigation progressed, detectives encountered numerous obstacles. Despite their best efforts, they struggled to find new leads or gather sufficient evidence. The case, which had started with high hopes, began to stagnate. As weeks turned into months and months into years, the investigation grew cold. As the years went by, Sherry's case became one of many cold cases that law enforcement struggled to resolve. The limitations of forensic science in the early 2000s meant that even though the knife and other evidence were preserved, there was little hope of making progress. The absence of new leads and the dwindling technological resources left Sherry's family and the Sanford community in a state of uncertainty and frustration. The cold case status of Sherry's murder was a heavy burden for both her family and the local police. Each anniversary of her death served as a painful reminder of the unresolved case and the enduring quest for justice. Despite multiple efforts to revisit the case, no new developments emerged. Sherry's family clung to hope, maintaining their fight for answers despite the passage of time. In May 2023, a renewed sense of hope emerged when Sanford police decided to revisit Sherry's cold case. Advances in DNA technology had transformed the field of forensic science, offering new tools for analyzing evidence that had been stored for decades. The knife, which had been carefully preserved, was re-examined using modern forensic techniques. The breakthrough came when forensic experts confirmed that the blood on the knife belonged to Sherry Holtz. More significantly, DNA from the handle of the knife matched Gary Durrance. This revelation provided a direct link between Gary and the crime scene, marking a pivotal moment in the investigation. With this new evidence, investigators revisited witness statements and re-examined the case files. Gary Durrance had previously made statements that suggested he knew details about the crime scene that had not been made public. This knowledge further implicated him in the crime. On July 17, 2024, Gary Durrance was arrested and charged with second-degree murder in connection with Sherry Holtz's death. The DNA evidence, combined with his incriminating statements and history of domestic violence, provided a strong case against him. For Sherry's family and the Sanford community, Gary's arrest marked a significant milestone in their quest for justice. Gary's arrest brought a long-awaited sense of closure to Sherry's family and the community. The trial, scheduled to begin on September 10, 2024, 
will be an opportunity for the full extent of Gary's actions to be revealed in court. The resolution of Sherry Holtz's murder represents a triumph of persistence and scientific advancement, demonstrating that justice can prevail even after many years. The impact of Sherry Holtz's murder and the long quest for justice had profound effects on the Sanford community. The brutal nature of the crime left a lasting mark on the city, and the prolonged investigation highlighted the challenges faced by law enforcement in solving cold cases. The case became a symbol of the fight for justice and the role of forensic science in uncovering the truth. For Sherry's family, the journey was one of enduring pain and hope. The search for answers took a toll on their emotional well-being, but their commitment to seeking justice never wavered. The eventual resolution of the case provided a measure of solace, although it could not fully erase the trauma of Sherry's death. The resolution of Sherry Holtz's case underscores the critical role of forensic science in solving crimes. Advances in DNA technology have transformed the field, enabling investigators to re-examine evidence from cold cases with new tools. The breakthrough in Sherry's case was a testament to the progress made in forensic science and its impact on the pursuit of justice. Modern forensic techniques, such as DNA profiling, have revolutionized the ability to solve crimes and bring perpetrators to justice. The ability to analyze evidence that was previously inconclusive has opened new avenues for solving even the most elusive cases. Sherry's case stands as a powerful example of how scientific advancements can lead to breakthroughs in long-standing investigations. The story of Sherry Holtz's murder is a poignant reminder of the enduring quest for justice and the impact of forensic science in solving cold cases. The case, marked by its brutality and the prolonged search for answers, highlights the importance of perseverance and the relentless pursuit of truth. Sherry's murder cast a dark shadow over Sanford, but the resolution of the case brings a measure of closure to her family and the community. As Gary Durrance faces his day in court, the community and Sherry's loved ones can find some solace in the knowledge that justice has been served. The case serves as a testament to the importance of continuing the fight for justice, no matter how much time has passed. The advances in forensic science have played a crucial role in solving this case, proving that even the coldest of cases can eventually be cracked open through dedication and technological progress. The resolution of Sherry Holtz's case not only provides closure but also serves as a beacon of hope for other cold cases awaiting justice. It is a powerful reminder that the pursuit of truth and justice is a relentless endeavor, driven by the tireless efforts of law enforcement and the advancements in science that continue to shape the future of criminal investigations. Secrets, Lies, and Murder The Dark Fate of Desiree Sunford In the tranquil and tight-knit communities of Yakima County, a harrowing tale unfolded that would forever cast a dark shadow over the area. The murder of Desiree Sunford on April 7, 2013, sent ripples of shock and grief through the neighborhoods, shaking the very fabric of a community where everyone knew each other. What began as a routine call about a potential break-in swiftly spiraled into one of the most disturbing and intricate cases ever confronted by the Yakima County Sheriff's Office. This tragic story, marked by deception, betrayal, and a chillingly orchestrated murder, altered the lives of everyone involved and forever impacted the community. Desiree Sunford was born on August 26, 1982, in Moses Lake, Grant County, Washington. She grew up surrounded by the warmth and stability of a loving family. Her mother, Connie Cass, played a pivotal role in providing a nurturing environment that allowed Desiree to flourish. The Sunford household was a place of comfort and joy deeply rooted in the small-town values and close-knit relationships characteristic of Yakima. Desiree's early years were marked by the happiness of family life and the supportive network of a community where everyone looked out for one another. Desiree's journey through life took a significant turn when she met Scott Sunford, a military veteran known for his disciplined and stoic demeanor. The couple's relationship, from an outsider's perspective, seemed to be the epitome of a loving partnership. They were actively involved in community events, supported local causes, and were seen as a model couple. However, beneath the surface of their seemingly perfect marriage, there were complexities and hidden tensions that would later unravel in the most tragic way. 
The morning of April 7, 2013, began with an unsettling normality. Desiree's husband, Scott Stanford, was away attending his aunt's funeral in Pasco. At home, Desiree was alone when an intruder breached the back door of their house. The security system detected the intrusion and sent an alert, but Desiree, unaware of the imminent danger, remained unprepared. Scott, alerted by the notifications, raced back home but chose to wait outside, apprehensive and fearful, despite his extensive military training. His reluctance to enter the house immediately and check on Desiree seemed odd and unsettling to the officers who arrived on the scene. When the police entered the dimly lit home, they were confronted with a nightmare. Bullet casings littered the floor, leading them to Desiree's lifeless body in the master bedroom. She had been shot nine times, with a fatal shot to her head. The evidence suggested a desperate struggle for survival as she had attempted to crawl away from her attacker. Desiree's mother, Connie Cast, was devastated by the news. The loss of her daughter in such a brutal manner was compounded by the troubling revelations about Scott. His composed and detached demeanor during the investigation, combined with his focus on discussing his guns and military service rather than expressing grief, raised red flags for the detectives. As the investigation deepened, inconsistencies emerged in Scott's alibi. He claimed to have been at his aunt's funeral, but the timeline of his return and his lack of urgency after receiving security alerts contradicted his statements. The detectives began to scrutinize Scott's relationship with Paige Blades, his alleged mistress, uncovering a more intricate involvement than initially apparent. Paige Blades admitted to having a secret affair with Scott, which evolved into a polyamorous relationship involving Desiree. The details of this relationship were kept hidden from Desiree, and as tensions escalated, it appeared that Paige and Scott had motives for Desiree's murder. Paige revealed that she had been living with Scott and Desiree part-time and even shared the same bed, a revelation that complicated the investigation further. Adding another layer of complexity, Paige was discovered to be pregnant with Scott's child. This development introduced additional motives and intrigue. Paige's confession that her friend Marty Grismer was involved in the murder redirected the investigation, uncovering a new suspect. Marty Grismer, a confidant of Paige, was identified as the perpetrator. He had entered the Sunford home under the pretense of a burglary, only to confront and murder Desiree in a brutal attack. Paige's pregnancy and Marty's confession seemed to tie the case together, but it soon became evident that the investigation had missed crucial details. Paige's prior discussions with Marty about planning the perfect murder cast doubt on her involvement. Further investigation revealed incriminating evidence at Marty's workplace, including gun parts and stolen items, which provided the final proof needed to convict him. The impact of Desiree Sunford's murder on the Yakima community was profound. The case highlighted the destructive power of concealed emotions and complex relationships, serving as a stark reminder of how deeply personal conflicts can escalate into tragedy. The story of Desiree Sunford stands as a somber testament to the ways in which hidden motives and unresolved tensions can result in devastating consequences, forever altering the lives of those involved and leaving a lasting imprint on the community. Marty Grismer's trial began in early 2014, with the prosecution presenting a compelling case against him. Key evidence included his confession, forensic analysis linking him to the crime scene, and testimonies from those involved. The defense attempted to challenge the evidence and suggest alternative theories, but the prosecution's case was robust. Grismer was ultimately found guilty of first-degree murder in July 2014. The court sentenced him to life in prison without the possibility of parole reflecting the gravity of his crime. The conviction of Marty Grismer brought some semblance of justice to Desiree Sunford's family and the community. However, the case left many unanswered questions and highlighted the dark undercurrents in seemingly ordinary lives. Desiree's mother, Connie Cast, expressed a mix of relief and ongoing sorrow, acknowledging the closure brought by the trial but also grappling with the profound loss of her daughter. Desiree Sunford's tragic death serves as a stark reminder of the destructive power of deception and betrayal. The case revealed a complex web of relationships and motives that culminated in a brutal crime. As the community reflects on the impact of Desiree's death, 
the story underscores the need to address the hidden issues that can lead to such devastating outcomes. The investigation and trial uncovered a dark reality behind the facade of normalcy, leaving a lasting impact on those who knew and loved Desiree. On a quiet spring evening in Raleigh, North Carolina, the vibrant life of 23-year-old Stephanie Bennett was cruelly and senselessly taken. Stephanie was just beginning to carve out her future, a bright young woman with dreams, ambitions, and a loving family who adored her. But on May 21, 2002, those dreams were shattered. Inside her own apartment, she fell victim to a heinous crime that left her loved ones devastated and a community in shock. The brutality of the murder sent waves of fear throughout Raleigh, but the identity of her killer would remain a mystery for three agonizing years. In those years, Stephanie's name became a haunting reminder of the unsolved crime that loomed over the city. The man behind this unthinkable act was Drew Plantin, an unassuming state lab employee who harbored a dark secret and a twisted desire. Plantin's meticulous nature allowed him to blend in seamlessly, avoiding the suspicion of neighbors and co-workers alike. But his cunning facade would eventually crack, revealing the terrifying truth of a cold-blooded predator who hid in plain sight. This is the story of Stephanie Bennett, her tragic end, and the relentless pursuit of justice that finally brought her killer to light. Stephanie Bennett was born on August 30, 1979 in the small American town of Rocky Mount, Virginia. When she was little, her parents divorced and Stephanie stayed with her mother. However, their father lived near their home and the young woman continued to see him almost every day. Later, her father remarried and Stephanie gained a stepsister named Diana. After school, Stephanie enrolled in Roanoke College located 350 kilometers from her home. In her final year, she met a guy named Walter and they soon started dating. After college, the couple moved to different cities, but they continued to be together. Stephanie moved to the city of Raleigh, North Carolina with her stepsister, Diana, and their mutual friend, Emily. The three of them rented an apartment in the Bridgeport residential complex located in a quiet, peaceful area on the outskirts of the city. The young woman found a job at IBM while her boyfriend moved to Greenville, South Carolina to obtain an engineering degree. Stephanie lived in Raleigh for about a year. By that time, she and her sister and friend were planning to move to different cities. The young woman who was only 23 at the time was planning to move to Greenville to be with her boyfriend, and the couple had already begun looking for a place to rent. In May, Stephanie went to Greenville where she and Walter looked at several apartments and chose a suitable option for rent. When she returned to Raleigh, her friends and sister were no longer in the apartment. Emily had moved to another city and Diana had gone away for a few days to attend a funeral. On the evening of May 20th, Stephanie came home from work and spoke to Walter on the phone. Her boyfriend was planning to send her rental agreement via fax for her to sign. They agreed that he would send it the next day when she could use her work computer. The following day, Walter tried to reach her, but Stephanie didn't answer either her work or home phone. He then called her sister Diana who contacted Stephanie's colleagues. It turned out that Stephanie didn't show up to work that day, which was very unusual. Stephanie was always responsible and would have informed her boss if she was sick. Moreover, if she was at home sick, she would have answered the phone. Diana asked her friend to go to their apartment and check if everything was okay. There was no answer when they knocked on the door. Then Diana asked the apartment manager to open the door with a spare key. As soon as the man entered the apartment, he saw a horrifying sight. Stephanie was lying lifeless on the floor of the room with no clothes on and bruises on her neck. The manager immediately called the police. Detectives found Stephanie's documents and confirmed that the deceased was indeed her through a photo. On the laundry basket cover, which was under the window in Emily's bedroom, Investigators noticed leaves and concluded that the killer may have entered the apartment through the window. They also discovered that the home phone was in the closet in Emily's room and the cable was cut. Apparently, the perpetrator was hiding there and took the phone with him so Stephanie couldn't use it. After speaking with Diana, 
the police determined that several items were missing from the apartment. The perpetrator took $8 from Stephanie's wallet, two tape recorders, and the laundry basket from Stephanie's room. It seemed that he had put the stolen items inside the basket. Experts found semen on the victim's body and extracted a DNA sample, but it wasn't in the FBI database. They also determined that the cause of death was strangulation. Interestingly, the perpetrator took the object he used to kill a victim with as the police were unable to find it in the apartment. Meanwhile, investigators interviewed all the residents of the complex hoping someone might have seen the killer. During these conversations, the police learned that something strange had been happening in the residential complex for several months. People regularly noticed someone peeping at them through the windows of their apartments. They complained to the manager, but the management of the complex could not find the person. Interestingly, at least once this person was seen at Stephanie's window. In addition, several months ago, an unknown man near the lake near the complex assaulted a young woman who went for a run. After this incident, Stephanie was afraid to stay alone in this apartment and wanted to move to Greenwell as soon as possible. Detectives studied the area around the complex and discovered something strange. In the bushes, they found dozens of pieces of women's underwear, which has later turned out belonged to Stephanie. The police thought the killer took them out of the apartment, but then for some reason, threw them in the bushes. However, soon this version was refuted. It turned out that a teenager living in the neighboring apartment regularly sneaked into Stephanie's room and stole her underwear after which he threw it into the bushes. He admitted this when investigators questioned all the residents, but he denied his involvement in the murder. His DNA sample was taken and it did not match the sample obtained from the killer's semen. For this reason, he was no longer suspected of the crime. The police believe that the most obvious candidate for the role of the killer was the same man who repeatedly peeped at the female residents of the complex through the windows. After talking to everyone who had ever noticed this person, the detectives compiled an approximate portrait. It was published in newspapers, but it did not yield any results. As part of the standard procedure, investigators checked the victim's boyfriend. He voluntarily gave his DNA, which did not match the killer sample. In addition, at the time of the murder, Walter was hundreds of kilometers away from her home and physically could not have been there. After that, the police went to all the male residents of the complex asking them to voluntarily give their DNA. This also did not yield any results. The experts did not find a single match among the 283 samples obtained. At this point, they did not have any serious leads. Detectives organized surveillance of the residential complex hoping to catch the man who was spying on the residents. To their surprise, they quickly succeeded. On June 3, the police noticed a man who approached several windows on the ground floor and peered into the apartments. Stopping at one of the windows, this person began to satisfy himself, and the police immediately arrested him. This pervert turned out to be Christopher Lee Cambin who had been caught spying several times before and had been convicted of stalking a woman three years earlier. The detectives thought they had finally caught the killer, but they were disappointed. Christopher's DNA did not match the sample found on the victim's body. He was charged with spying, but they stopped considering him a suspect in the murder case. Since then, the police continued to work on the case, but they had no substantial leads. A year later, the lead detective heard about a lab in Florida that could determine a person's ethnicity based on their DNA. However, he had doubts about this technology, but he didn't want to miss such an opportunity. As a test, he sent the DNA of four of his colleagues of different ethnicities to the lab. The experts succeeded in their task 100%, and the detective sent them the DNA of Stephanie's killer. The lab determined that the DNA belonged to a white person, but this information did not help the police much. The victim's father offered a reward of $100,000 for any information that would lead to the capture of the killer. Her mother wrote a letter which was published in local newspapers begging people to share with the police any information that could help identify the suspect. All of this brought some new leads, but they did not lead anywhere. In April 2004, based on the testimony of multiple witnesses, detectives decided to interview all residents of the complex again. They suspected that the man arrested for voyeurism might not have been the only one who walked around the complex buildings and peeked into other people's windows. 
Knowing the identity of the first man and having his photographs, the investigators wanted to talk to the residents who had seen the voyeur again. Unfortunately, none of them had ever seen his face. Most often, this man appeared at night, and he almost always wore a hood. However, some witnesses said they saw him without the hood but could only see that he had long hair. Detectives interviewed several dozen people until they finally reached a man who saw this person right in front of Stephanie's window before her murder. His testimony was already with the police, but this time he remembered something else. The witness claimed that he saw this person a few days after the incident during daylight hours. This man was walking his dog near the wooded area behind the residential complex, and the witness recognized him by his hoodie. He watched him for a while until he disappeared behind the trees with his Labrador. Apparently, the witness simply forgot about this incident, or did not think it was related to the murder. So during the initial questioning, the police did not receive this information. One thing is for sure, detectives only obtained this information two years after Stephanie's death. Now they knew they should be looking for a man with a Labrador. Judging by the fact that this person was walking his dog in the area, he must have lived nearby. And here the detectives noted one interesting fact. Behind the forested area where the witness saw the man, there was another residential complex. He could well have lived there. The police went there and asked the staff if there was a man with a Labrador among the complex residents. They immediately gave them the name of 35-year-old Drew Planton as well as added a few interesting details. All the complex employees considered him somewhat strange. He hardly talked to anyone, never looked people in the eye, and was generally very unsociable. The man was very thin with long hair, and always wore bay clothes. Many people thought he was trying to attract as little attention as possible. In his case, however, it worked just the opposite. The police decided to find out more about this person and talk to an elderly resident who, according to the staff, kept an eye on everything happening in the complex. And here they were in for a very unexpected turn. When they told her they were investigating the murder of Stephanie Bennett, the woman replied, Haven't you arrested anyone yet? Everyone knows it was that guy with the big dog. The detectives were, to say the least, shocked. It took them two years to get to this person and the residents of his complex initially suspected this man, but none of them deemed it necessary to share their suspicions with the police and settled on the other side of town. The investigators decided to talk to him and came to his apartment, but no one responded to their knock on the door. They came there several more times at different times of the day and never received an answer. Either the man was never home or he intentionally did not open the door for them. While they tried to locate Drew, the police questioned his former neighbors at his old place of residence. They managed to find several witnesses who shared troubling facts. A woman living on the floor above had seen Drew in the company of a young boy a few days after Stephanie's murder. They were walking down the street and talking about something. According to the witness, Drew asked the boy to stop contacting the police and not to tell them anything. The investigators immediately concluded that the young man in question was the same teenager who had stolen underwear from the victim's apartment. Several women had reported being genuinely afraid of Drew having spotted him during the runs or walks in secluded areas. The man would either closely observe them or even follow them. Detectives who had been unable to speak with Drew found his place of work and headed there. He was a chemist at a fertilizer production laboratory and the investigators managed to catch him at his workplace. He immediately stated that he had not heard of Stephanie Bennett's murder, which was strange considering that he lived just a kilometer away from her complex at the time. The man clearly had no desire to talk to the police and told them he was very busy at the moment. Drew told the investigators that they could come to his home at an appointed time and he would answer all their questions. The detectives met him at his apartment and the man finally opened the door to them. During the conversation, he stated that he had never walked his dog near Stephanie's complex. However, given that the police had many witnesses who had repeatedly seen him in that area, the investigators immediately understood that he was lying. The man also claimed that he did not wear glasses even though his driver's license indicated that he was required to wear them while driving and several witnesses had reported that the man who was peeping into the windows of other apartments wore glasses. 
As expected, Drew refused to voluntarily provide a DNA sample. The detectives then decided to conduct surveillance on him hoping to obtain a sample in a different way. However, this proved to be a very difficult task since the man did not leave behind any items that could be sent to the laboratory. For example, during lunch breaks, he would leave work, sit in his car, and just stare at one point. The man did not eat anything, so the investigators could not obtain any objects with his DNA. Once they noticed Drew throwing an empty water bottle into a garbage bin, detectives took it and sent it to the laboratory, but experts were unable to extract a DNA sample from it. According to one version, Drew took someone else's bottle and purposely threw it on the street knowing that he was being watched. After that, the police decided to obtain his garbage, but here too they were unsuccessful. For several days, they never saw Drew take it out. Interestingly, the man's neighbors also could not remember ever seeing him with a trash bag. Next, investigators asked Drew's boss for help. The woman agreed to help them obtain any item from his workplace that might contain Drew's DNA. She watched him for several days, but was unable to get a hold of any item. Drew rarely ate at work, never threw anything away, and she couldn't find a single hair on his desk, which seemed strange given that the man had fairly long hair. Investigators were already convinced that Drew was intentionally covering up all traces to prevent them from obtaining his DNA. One day, the boss saw him tying his hair back with a rubber band and then bending down to pick up all the hairs that fell in the process. After that, the woman decided to invite him for a lunch break at a cafe to supposedly discuss some work matters. But even there, the man was extremely cautious. He mostly ate with his hands, put all the used napkins in his pocket, and even took the straw and cup with his drink. For dessert, they ordered banana pudding and Drew finally used a fork, but then wiped it with a damp napkin for 15 minutes, ruling out any possibility of obtaining a DNA sample from the utensil. Despite this, the investigators still took the fork and sent it to the laboratory. The experts were able to find tiny traces of DNA, which showed a partial match with the DNA of Stephanie's killer. However, the result was too imprecise as more biological material was needed for a full comparison. In the end, the detectives obtained a warrant to search Drew's workplace. They hoped to find some item containing his DNA. The investigators were afraid that the man might escape if he found out about the search, so they decided to conduct it in the evening. Among the suspect's belongings, they found gloves that he had to wear when working with chemicals. The detectives understood that his DNA might be inside, so they took them and left another pair in their place. They still feared that Drew might try to run, so they kept him under surveillance for several days until the laboratory confirmed. The gloves did in fact contain his DNA. On October 18, 2005, police quietly surrounded the laboratory where a man worked and waited for him to come out. Investigators feared that if they tried to arrest him inside the building, he might take one of his colleagues hostage or attack them. Their concerns were not unfounded. When the man emerged from the building, he was immediately apprehended. He was found to have a loaded pistol on him and apparently knew that the police were just steps away from catching him and had no plans to surrender easily. During a six-hour interrogation, the man, Drew, remained silent and refused food, water, and hardly moved. Eventually, detectives had to put him in a wheelchair to move him around the area. After obtaining a search warrant for his apartment, investigators found a laundry basket stolen from Stephanie's home two rifles, 40 knives, a sword, and a machete. Among his belongings, detectives also found a set of lock picks and handcuffs. They found a notebook with dozens of women's names and immediately located them to ensure they were safe. One of the women was the same resident of his complex who had complained about Jude during the investigation. She said that he had been watching her on the street, and she felt uncomfortable with his gaze. Her concerns were confirmed when police found her underwear and tampons in Drew's home, as well as a copy of her high school graduation tape. It turned out that Drew had broken into her apartment, taken the tape, made a copy, and returned the original. All this time, he kept these items even after moving. In his apartment, they also found a check in the name of a woman who was killed in 1999. Investigators learned that at the time Drew lived in her city and moreover, 
the woman was shot with a fairly rare caliber gun. But exactly such a weapon was found in the man's collection during the search. Thus, Drew became a suspect in this case, but first he had to stand trial for the murder of Stephanie. A month after his arrest, the prosecution officially announced that they would seek the death penalty. The trial was supposed to begin the following year and Drew spent that time in solitary confinement, but the trial never happened. On January 1, 2006, a man was found dead in the same cell. Despite all precautions taken, he managed to end his life. Investigators had no doubt that Drew had killed Stephanie Bennett, but after a search of his house, the inevitable question arose. Drew was highly likely to have been responsible for the woman's murder in 1999, but detectives were practically certain that Drew could have been involved in other crimes. After carefully studying his biography, the police discovered several interesting facts. Drew grew up in a complete family with three brothers. Their father constantly humiliated and beat the children until the mother fled with them to another state. As a result, Drew became a very withdrawn teenager, and this only intensified in the future. Despite this, he received a good education and got a decent job as a chemist. His colleagues said he was very smart, but his social skills were practically non-existent. He had no friends, he didn't talk to anyone at work, and always tried to keep as far away from the team as possible. Interestingly, Drew's own brother also had a criminal record. He peeped at women with a hidden camera and received a suspended sentence. In 2008, Drew's mother sued the state government accusing the authorities of causing her son's death. However, the judge concluded that the prison staff had taken all prescribed precautions and could not stop the man. Stephanie Bennett's father tried to sue the management of the residential complex for ignoring residents' reports of a peeping Tom and not paying enough attention to the safety of residents on the premises. In his opinion, there was not enough lighting around the building at night, and anyone could walk there unnoticed. He also learned that the window in his daughter's apartment had been broken, but the complex management did not rush to fix this problem even though it was their direct responsibility. But in the end, the man himself refused these accusations, not commenting on his decision. Thus, this complex and confusing case was ultimately solved. Police to this day wonder how many other victims could Drew have had. The available information indicates that the man was prone to serial crimes, but after his death it became practically impossible to find out the truth. The murder of Stephanie Bennett was a heartbreaking tragedy that left an indelible mark on everyone who knew her and the community of Raleigh. For three long years, her family, friends, and law enforcement tirelessly searched for answers, refusing to let her case grow cold. The eventual capture and conviction of Drew Plantin brought some measure of justice, but it could never truly heal the wounds left by Stephanie's brutal death. Plantin's arrest was a testament to the persistence of investigators and the power of modern forensic science, which ultimately uncovered the dark truth behind his ordinary facade. Yet, Stephanie's story is also a stark reminder of the dangers that can lurk in the most unsuspecting places and the innocent lives that are forever changed by such acts of violence. Her legacy continues to live on through the memories of those who loved her and the relentless pursuit of justice in her name. As we reflect on this case, we are reminded that behind every headline is a person whose life was stolen, a family whose hearts were broken, and a community left searching for solace. Stephanie Bennett deserves so much more than the fate that befell her. And while we can never undo the past, we must remember to honor her by striving for a world where such tragedies are prevented, and justice, no matter how delayed, is always served.